Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do indeed give salvation to your people. We thank you that you are a speaking God and that you accomplish things through speech. We pray now that your word would not return void, that it would accomplish everything that you've set out for it to accomplish. We pray that we'd be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We pray that we'd be sanctified by your word and spirit. We pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to believe and hands and feet that are eager and willing to do your will as you conform us more and more to the image of our glorified and risen Savior, Jesus. It is in his name and washed in his blood and clothed in his robe of righteousness and indwelt by your spirit that we pray. Amen. Well, please be seated and turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 17. And today we want to look at a portrait of thanksgiving. It's not necessarily telling us what to do to be thankful, but it's showing us what does thankfulness look like? What does it sound like? And there's a really wonderful story here of Jesus healing ten lepers, and one in particular returns uh, to thank him. And it gives us a really beautiful image of what thankfulness looks and sounds like. And in his commentary, when he was introducing this uh, section of Luke, Phil Riken told a very funny story about a family that was in Kansas and that they had been devastated by a tornado and they lost everything, including their only son had been taken up in the tornado as well. And so they prayed out to the Lord. They said, Lord, please have mercy on us. Please give us our, our son back. And the heavens opened up and the sun comes down and the sun is standing before them. And then the mother puts her hands on their hips and said, Lord, he had a hat. And it kind of shows us that sometimes we don't realize the embarrassment of riches that we have because we constantly want more. And here the Lord had provided for them, given them exactly what they asked for, and there was an element of dissatisfaction because they wanted more. And sometimes when we're honest with ourselves, that's where our hearts are as well. We have an embarrassment of riches that we have received from the Lord in terms of salvation, and we have uh, an abundance of riches that we have in the material world as well. And sometimes it's difficult for us to be thankful or to show ourselves as, uh, uh, show ourselves as having gratitude for these things. And here we have a really wonderful story of what Thanksgiving looks like and what it sounds like. Let's hear the word of Lord, uh, the word of the Lord in Luke 17, starting in verse 11. It says, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voice, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So far the reading of God's holy word. So this morning I'd like to look at three things as we consider this passage. First, the leper's prayer, and that's plural. So if you're taking notes, the leper's S apostrophe. All ten lepers prayed. Second, the Lord's response. And third, the leper's singular, thanksgiving. So the lepers' plural prayer, all ten of them prayed, the Lord's response, and then the lepers' singular thanksgiving at what the Lord had done for him. And there's this beginning, the very first verse that we read says, on the way to Jerusalem. Don't miss the fact that that phrase is there. We're kind of parachuting into the middle of Luke, but there was a real decisive turning point in the Gospel of Luke where after Peter rightly confessed that Jesus is the Lord and Savior, it says he turned his face towards Jerusalem. 
And the rest of the Gospel of Luke is unpacking with this mission where Jesus is making a beeline on his way to Jerusalem. And he's going to Jerusalem for a very specific reason and a very specific purpose. It's not just to go there and hang out there, but he's going there on a rescue mission. He's going there to pay the penalty for his people's sins. He's going there to redeem and to rescue his people and to save them. He's going there to die the obedient death, even death on a cross, for his people. And so all of this is happening on his way to Jerusalem. We'll visit that again at the end, but I wanted to point it out at the beginning here because the context is important. But the first thing that we want to look at is the lepers, all ten of them, their their prayer. It says that ten lepers stood at a distance. Why were they standing at a distance? It's because that they were unclean. They were ceremonially unclean. According to the law that God had given in Numbers and in Leviticus, this is what it says about lepers. In Numbers 5, 1 through 2, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or has a discharge, and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. In Leviticus, it had said, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Really, it might be difficult for us to to imagine what living a life as a leper would be. But think of it as complete banishment, as aloneness, as alienation, as separation from all human contact, from all human touch, from the things that we are so used to. There's no hugs. There's no human touch. There's no family. They have no part in the corporate worship. They can't go either to the synagogue or the temple or the tabernacle. There's nothing for them to do. Sinclair Ferguson said it's really described as a living death. They're physically and spiritually and relationally separated. Their bodies are aching. They have open sores. They're constantly in pain. They can't use almost any of their extremities in the way that we would normally use them. They're constantly not able to get rest, not able to feel just a normal day of what it means to be human. A living death is really a great way to say it, as Sinclair Ferguson did. Leprosy ravages the whole body. It's also a good image for the ravages of sin. I'm not saying that these lepers had uh, leprosy because of particular sins. We're using leprosy as an analogy for what sin does to us. One theologian said, sin destroys our body. Sin divides our relationships. Sin hinders our fellowship, and sin destroys worship, doesn't it? It really affects us holistically. We die because we're sinners. It affects us physically in terms of our body. It divides relationships because all sin really is a lack of love towards one another, so it hurts or harms those relationships. It hinders fellowship and trust and community, and it also distorts our worship with the Lord as well. Leprosy is really a wonderful image for the ravages of sin and how it holistically, body and soul, physically and spiritually, wrecks us. And so we recognize these these lepers' prayer. They've been in this situation their whole life, alone, banished, alienated, separated, a living death. And then the lepers see Jesus coming. Perhaps they've already heard stories about him from the, earlier in the Gospel of Luke. He's already healed lepers. He's already healed diseases. And maybe they've heard about Jesus enough to realize that here's someone coming down the road that we see at a distance that can do something about our situation. Here's somebody who can help. Here's someone with compassion. Here's someone who can save. Here's someone who's powerful. Whatever they've heard about him, they've recognized him as merciful. And so they lifted up their voices and they cry out a prayer, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. This is a really good prayer as far as it goes, isn't it? They call out to Jesus. They use his personal name. Certainly they have heard about him. Jesus actually means Savior. They're calling out Savior. And they're asking for mercy. 
And they call him master, recognizing that he has authority, that he's sovereign, that he's someone who can do something about this. And then they ask for mercy. They're recognizing that any claim that they make is not based on something that Jesus would owe them, but something that he would do out of goodness, that he would do out of grace, that he would do out of mercy. He freely gives these things. This is the kind of savior that we serve. This is what Luke has been showing us, his gregarious nature and his compassion to care for those who are hurting and those who are sick and those who are lost and those who are diseased and those who are stuck in sin. And Jesus, over and over throughout the Gospels, has showed himself that way. And so here they're not asking for any kind of quid pro quo. They're not negotiating with Jesus saying, look, we'll do this for you, but could you do this for us? They're just crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They call out to him. You know, one theologian one time said that prayer is really a declaration of dependence, isn't it? It's rightly aligning ourselves with the reality that Everything that we have comes from him. We sing every week in this church, right? Praise God from whom all blessings flow, right? Not just some of them, but all blessings. We're utterly dependent upon the Lord for those things that we have materially and those things that we have spiritually. And so prayer is rightly declaring our dependence on the Lord for everything. And here the lepers are rightly declaring that He is the one, Jesus is the one who can do something about this. And the Lord visits us in kindness in the common blessings that he gives us. And the Lord visits us in mercy and grace with the spiritual blessings that he gives us. And so here these ten lepers pray out, asking Jesus, the master, to have mercy on them. And that leads to our second point. We want to consider the Lord's response. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. Presumably, they had been declared unclean by a priest. Thus, according to the law, they needed to be declared clean by a priest in order to return to the normal community life. This is kind of an interesting story. When you're reading it, would you have expected Jesus to say, based on everything you know about him earlier in the gospel, that he's going to tell them, look, go show yourself to the priest? rather than either pick up some uh, dirt or something and touch them and heal them, or just say a word and heal them, or tell them that they're well, or something. It's kind of an unusual situation. But it's really kind of drawing us in and showing us something. The Lord wants them to be fully restored to the community, and they had been declared unclean by a priest. They must be declared clean by a priest as well. And it's interesting to think about in the Old Covenant, when unclean and clean touch... What happened to the clean thing? It became unclean. But in the new covenant, when Jesus is here, when the clean and the unclean touch, the unclean becomes clean. It's really marvelous to think about that Jesus is here, is that he's bringing about a new reality. All the priests of the old co- that the old covenant could do is declare someone unclean or declare them clean. Now the priest of the new covenant is here and he can make somebody clean. Not just declare them that way, but make them that way. It's remarkable to think about. If you want to read about what it took in the Old Covenant in order to go through this purification ceremony, you can read about the whole thing in Leviticus chapter 14, and I would encourage you to do that maybe later this afternoon or later this week. But the priests in the Old Covenant also functioned as a health inspector or to be able to certify that someone is you know, able to go back out into the community. And it's interesting, when you look at Leviticus 14, the law showed them their need, and it also showed them their provision, what they needed to do. And here's just a summary. The priest was to go outside of the camp to meet them. Two birds were to be brought forward. Uh, they were, uh, one of them was killed, and its blood was sprinkled on the other one seven times. One was sacrificed, and the other one was set free. The person was to wash their clothes and bathe themselves. It was a seven-day ritual that they had to go through. On the eighth day, two male lambs without blemish were to be brought, also a grain offering. The priest offered one lamb as a guilt offering in place of the sin offering and a burnt offering. 
Some of the blood of the offering was put on the right ear, the right hand, and the right foot of the person that was to be cleansed. A sin offering was also made. And if they were poor, some other provision was made for them. It's just remarkable to think about everything that had, had to go through. And all of those sacrifices, in one way or another, are pointing forward to our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is now standing before them. And he's not just going to be able to declare someone clean, he's going to be able to make them clean. And note that they act, one theologian said, as if doing what Jesus said makes a difference. (laughs) He said, go and show yourselves, and they went. It's remarkable to think about. Jesus told them to do something, and they did it. Would that that would be all Christians' response all the time, right? But it is showing fruit. It is showing faith. It is showing obedience. They're acting as if the word of Jesus mattered. You might have thought, well, what good is that going to do? They didn't ask any of those questions, or at least Luke doesn't record that for us. They're still leprous. He just said, go and show yourselves to the priest." Thinking about the situation with the family at the beginning when it said, you know, Lord, please give us our kid back. And they get the kid and they're like, well, where's the hat? Here's will be like, well, what, a, what is this? What do you mean go and show myself to the priest? But they went. They acted as if what Jesus said mattered. And they acted upon it. And then verse 14 simply says, as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. What a remarkably short phrase to encompass such a marvelous reality. Can you even imagine? The text doesn't tell us the specifics. But imagine a disease that you've had your whole life, that you've suffered with, that you've been in pain with, that you may have had to scrape yourself with pieces of stone. You've bled, you've had... Pus. I don't want to do graphic or sick. You've been separated from people forever, your whole life. And now you start walking and everything changes. Your sores are gone. Your skin is healed. Your hands, your feet, your ears. No more swollenness, no more pain, no more suffering. They start to notice this about one another for the first time, like, looking at one another and seeing what's going on. Can you even imagine what that must have been like for them? It's remarkable to think about how quick and how holistic and how remarkable. As they went, they were cleansed. The Lord has done something marvelous. They heard the word of the Lord and they acted upon it and that made all the difference in the world, one theologian said. Note that they had asked for mercy. The word that they used there could really be for cleansing or healing. They weren't so much asking for salvation. They wanted a healing, didn't they? To the lepers, this seemed like the most pressing and important need in their life. They have this disease, and I don't want this disease anymore. I want to be freed from this. I want to be released from this. I want to be cleansed. I want to be healed. And Jesus is merciful. And Jesus is compassionate. And he does it. He grants their wish. He cleanses them. He heals them. And that's part of the story, but not the whole story. Note that ten of them called out for this healing. Ten of them called out for this cleansing. And all ten of them got exactly what they prayed for. Here's a high priest who isn't just going to reclassify them from your unclean to now you're clean. He made them clean. He cleansed them. He healed them. He made them whole. He's in essence reversing the curse, isn't he? There's a new sheriff in town. There's a new king in town. There's a new high priest in town. What we say and what we do and what we believe about him matters. So the last thing we want to look at is the leper's singular thanksgiving. It's remarkable and humbling to think about. In verse 15 it says, Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice. 
he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. This is a wonderful portrait of gratitude. This is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like to be touched by the grace and by the mercy and the kindness of God. All that we have needed, his hands have provided. Great is his faithfulness. Can we sing that? Can we rejoice in that? Can we come before him and say, thank you. I'm so thankful for everything that you have provided for me. Do we sometimes want more? Do we sometimes want a hat? Of course. But can we recognize and be content and grateful and thankful for the embarrassment of riches that the Lord has given us? And none of those things does he owe us. And it's not that he does it begrudgingly or stingily. He delights to give us these things. He's thrilled to give us these things. He longs to give us this thing. Sometimes scripture even presents us as if God has these blessings for us and it says we don't have because we don't ask. He's ready and willing to give us all that we need. Come and ask. And Jesus, in this situation, he asked three questions which invite us into the story and which reveal the heart. And it also says something to those who are standing around or saw this or heard this story. He asks, were not ten cleansed? Which is a rhetorical question. Of course ten were cleansed. The answer is uh, cleansed, obviously. Where are the nine? It's meant to invite us in. Where are, where are the nine? It's contemplative. It's causing us to consider. In other words, where is their gratitude? Where is their thanks? Where is their relationship with Jesus? Where is their relationship with the Savior? And finally, he asked, was no one found to return to give praise to God except for this foreigner? It's an interesting phrase. Earlier, it had noted that he was a Samaritan. And then by this point in the Gospel of Luke, by chapter 17, there had been a rising tension between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in particular. They were constantly trying to tra trap him. They were constantly trying to trick him. They were actually plotting to kill him. And they have shaken their fists at him and said, we will not have this man rule over us. They've shown the hardness of their hearts. They've shown their hatred. And now Jesus is using this as an example to say, look, it wasn't even from the house of Israel. It was from an outsider that is showing this thanks and this gratitude to God. It's really meant to be a slight rebuke or a humbling to recognize, look, this one who's not even of the same privileges or uh, covenant as you are has come, which has been the promise to Abraham all along that in you all the nations shall be blessed. And now here's this outsider coming and showing gratefulness to Jesus, thanking Jesus, praising Jesus, worshiping Jesus, recognizing him as the Savior. Luke is trying to highlight this for us. He's trying to placard before us who Jesus is. And that there is salvation in no other name and no other person and no other Savior. Come. Come. You who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest, Jesus says. So Jesus asks these questions to invite us in. Where are the nine? Where are the others? Where are even the rightful heirs to the blessing? It's easy for us maybe to think, well, what's the big deal? about ingratitude or a lack of thankfulness? Is it really, in the overall scheme of things, is it that important? And in Romans chapter 1 of, uh, through uh, chapter 3, Paul really is sending out a devastating look at what we look like in our fallen condition. And one of the things that Paul says there is, for all they, they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish minds were darkened. They didn't honor him, and they didn't give thanks to him. Ingratitude and a lack of thankfulness is a deadly sin, as all, are all sins. It shows us what's in our hearts. We're not really thankful to the Lord. We're not honoring him. We're not grateful. We're begrudging his gifts. We're constantly wishing we had more. We're involved in envy. It really tells us a lot. Ingratitude is a big deal. 
It's one of the sins for which Christ went to the cross to pay the penalty for our lack of gratitude, isn't it? It's a prevailing sin in the last days as well. In 2 Timothy we read, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Aren't you glad we don't live in days like this? Doesn't this really well describe our age? We are living in the last days. People are proud, lovers of self, lovers of money, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, on and on it goes. And that lack of gratitude is really manifested in the wilderness generation as well, which is partly probably Jesus' rebuke when he said, where, where are the nine? It's this, is it only this foreigner who's come? What was one of the major sins of the wilderness generation. They were constantly grumbling, they were constantly complaining, and they were constantly murmuring against the Lord. All of which are fruits of unbelief, not fruits of faith. They're constantly grumbling against the Lord. One theologian asked, are we ever blinded by blessings? It's really wonderful to think about. Have we ever been so blinded by the blessings that uh, Paradoxically, we sometimes realize the more we have, the less grateful that we are. The law of diminishing returns. The beginning of the story, he had a hat. We always want just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. It's interesting, if the others were sent to the priest, to the temple, Jesus notes that only one was found returned praising God. Well, you could ask the question, well, couldn't they have praised God from the temple? Or couldn't they have praised God from their homes? Surely. But what the point of Luke is, is to show that Jesus is God. The burden of the gospel of Luke is to highlight for us who Jesus is. And that we would believe and that we would trust and that we would have life in his name. We would have the forgiveness of our sins and wholeness and healing. Jesus is God. One of them returned praising God and was at the feet of Jesus, thanking him and praising him. In other words, Jesus is God. And Luke is seeking to make it really clear. Jesus equates the re Jesus is even equating the return to give him thanks with the return to give glory to God. And the return identifies or recognizes a public identification with Jesus. This man wants to be identified with Jesus. He's at his feet. He's praising him. He's worshiping him. He's glorifying him. And Jesus says, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And we could translate that, your faith has saved you. That word there. It's a different word from healed or cleansed. It's a different word from what they had originally prayed. This high priest was declaring something far more than that he was un not unclean anymore, but that you are forgiven, that you are declared righteous, that you are loved. And note that his faith had an object. He was believing and trusting in Jesus, not in faith, not in goodness in general, not in mercy in general, but in Jesus, the Lord. He was believing and trusting in this one. And as we hear this story, first, of course, we recognize it as an amazing and wonderful miracle and healing story, showing the compassion and mercy and kindness of our Savior. Second, we recognize again that leprosy is a really graphic image of our sin and our need, what it does to our bodies, what it does to our relationship, what it does to our worship. It's also a realization of a promise that has come, of a kingdom that's going to be manifest 
when Jesus comes, uh, the prophets had prophesied that he will heal the leper. He will cast out demons. He will give sight to the blind. He will cause the deaf to hear. And here it is happening. Don't miss it. This is Jesus. Something's different with him than everyone else in Scripture. And finally, it shows the love and the mercy and the grace and the goodness and the kindness and then the intentionality and the delight of Jesus to do these things. Not begrudgingly, but willingly. Note that ten started at a distance. One was basking in the nearness and the presence of Jesus. One theologian said nine wanted the gifts and one wanted the giver. Nine were made well and received what they wanted, but were still far away from Jesus. One was set free from something far more deadly than leprosy and was near the Savior. Sinclair Ferguson, in commenting on this passage, said, Surely the nine would have said, if you would have asked them, they would have said, I am so glad that I met Jesus because he cured me of my leprosy, which is wonderful. But he wonders, would the one have been able to say, it was my leprosy that actually led me to Jesus, and Jesus is the one who saved me from my sins. Recognizing that as debilitating and awful as leprosy is, that there's something far more debilitating and problematic, and that's being lost in our sin. That's being under the wrath and condemnation of God. And recognizing that Jesus saved him. Again, I said at the very beginning, don't miss the text when it says Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he's on his way to Jerusalem, beloved, because Jesus dies the leper's death for us. He dies outside of the camp. The clean for the unclean. The unblemished lamb for the blemished sheep. He was alone. He was abandoned. He was humiliated. He was condemned on that cross. What the lepers experienced in part, Jesus experienced in whole on that cross. But he did it for us. On that cross, he even was paying the penalty for all of our lack of gratitude, for our fair, failure to thank him or others, for all of our envy, for all of our greed, for all of our dissatisfaction, for all of our complaining, for all of our grumbling. Jesus, in his love, went to the cross and suffered a leper's death outside of the camp, alone, abandoned, humiliated, and condemned for us, paying the penalty for our sin. And remarkably, his obedience, his heart of gratitude, his heart of love, his obedience is credited to our account as if we had done it ourselves. Jesus receives that leper and all who come to him and gives them everything that they need. He gives them faith. He gives them life. He gives them forgiveness. He justifies them. He adopts them in and through the Spirit. He promises to be with them forever. He goes to prepare a place for us, and he's coming back. This is a really lovely portrait of what Thanksgiving looks like, to praise God and to be at the feet of Jesus. And beloved, to all of you who have confessed your sins, then be comforted and assured that they are forgiven. And that you are not under any condemnation and that everything that you need for faith and for life will be provided by the Savior. But if you don't yet know him, then let today be the day of salvation. He stands there and he says, come. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that is our prayer for you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this remarkable story of healing, the story of humility, the story of grace, the story of gratitude, the story of thanksgiving. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you for the compassion of Jesus. We thank you that he is powerful over sin, over Satan, over death, over diseases. And Father, we recognize that we have received an embarrassment of riches in Christ. I pray that we would show ourselves truly grateful 
and how we think about these things and how we talk about these things. I pray that we would show ourselves as those who have been cleansed, as those who have been touched, as those who have received mercy, as those who recognize these embarrassment of riches and how we go about treating other people. May we be humble. May we be grateful. May we be thankful. May we be praising you and glorifying you as we go about the things to which you've called us to do. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we are forgiven. We thank you that we are cleansed. We thank you that we are adopted. And we thank you that there's nothing in all of creation that can ever separate us from your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, please stand if you are able, and let's sing together number 245, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and we'll sing the last verse a cappella, number 245. Pardon for sin and a peace that endures, God's own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, 
blessings all ours with 10,000 beside. Great is his faithfulness. Great is his faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. All we have needed, his hand has provided. Great is his faithfulness, Lord, unto us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.